Hello everyone and welcome back from your afternoon tea. I uh, hope you had a great time. Uh, we're in the Kia Ora Theatre at uh, LinuxConf Australia in 2022 and next up we have Sam Bishop. Sam Bishop is a professional software developer, amateur rocket scientist and astronomer who loves Python, Django, cats, working on their personal software and hardware projects, everything space, playing games of all kind and tinkering with 3D printers. Sam's going to be talking about the users, challenges, and opportunities involved in open source so software running in space. Uh, he does have time for questions at the end, um, so we will make sure that you're writing your questions in the menu list tab while we go. Take it away. Hi. Uh, so yeah, while we're going, uh, Linux in space. I'm Sam Bishop, uh, freelance software developer, as you heard. My contact info is there on the slide there. Uh, and just for perspective, let's get a timeline going. As I said, questions at the end, it's a very broad talk, so plenty of time for questions at the end, so you can ask whatever sort of piques your interest. Now, going through the timeline here, we've got a few useful tidbits here. Linux started in 1991, we got Slackware two years later, a few more years down the line we got a mascot, and then we start to see the more business side, the more enterprise, stable, reliable, we can trust this to you know not die on us type things happening just after the year 2000. We've got Red Hat in 2002, and then four years later, Ubuntu coming out in 2004. And why this is relevant is that when you start to look at the history of Linux in space, what you see is that it didn't take long for Linux to start turning up in space as soon as people started to trust it. You've got in 1999, the start of a project to NASA evaluating whether Linux could fit into a software stack designed for running a space mission. Um, that didn't really result in any actual missions, but it was a thorough evaluation of how this kind of software fits into their overall planning. You've got 2003, QuakeSat, which was an earthquake investigation. It was powered with a Diamond Systems Prometheus PC104 module with a regular old x86 CPU. And despite it being only one year old at the time, it was running Red Hat Linux. Now, in a few years later, we have another mission, interestingly enough, using the Micro Linux, which is a version of Linux designed for computers without a memory management system, because the sort of hardware you can put in space tends to be very power constrained. Um, one of the things people tend to say is that when you put it in space, you put it back in time 10 years, because you end up picking software and hardware that's been around so long it's considered reliable and solid. Um, in 2007, we got another mission here. We've got ARM running Linux on a payload controller. Now, the difference between a payload controller and a full flight computer is that it's only responsible for part of the mission. So Linux wasn't responsible fundamentally for that entire mission there. Uh, we've got a follow up to that first micro Linux mission there where they were running it on their second follow up mission in 2009. And then out the gate strong, Linux in 2010 is what's powering the Falcon 9 rocket. So they put that rocket into space, flow it all the way there with Linux flying all the avionics. And then once the second stage reached orbit, it was responsible for the operation of that entire second stage in space. Um, and then following on through that, they also had their crew, the cargo capsule. Uh, again, all of its avionics and flight management running with a set of Linux computers. So we have another mission in 2011. It was just running the payload controller again, so not super interesting. But you'll start to see a trend here. So 2012, we've got another set of rocket launches. We've got lots of those happening that year. We've got three launches. So we keep moving on. We've got 2013. We have another set of missions happening with actual Linux flying satellites instead of rockets. We've got an ARM9 CPU running some fairly stock Linux there on the IPEX science mission. We have the Strand mission, which is running a micro Linux on a very small board. But the reason it's such a small board is because the other half of that mission was actually a stock Google Nexus 1. Uh, I say stock, there was some hardware modifications. It was stock software uh, running Android Linux. Uh, in the same year, we also had Planet Labs putting their first Dove satellites into orbit. So they put four highly modified 
well, actually not even modified, highly customized x86 Linux powered machines running regular Ubuntu Linux and half a terabyte of solid state storage on each of them into space. And those were taking uh, satellite photography. Now, SpaceX put up three more launches that year. The ISS also switched to Debian Linux that year because they were trying to make the environment more secure and reliable and didn't want any repeat incidences like the time the worm managed to get, you know, infect the uh, Windows laptops on the International Space Station because someone had brought it up on a floppy disk. Uh, they kind of didn't want any more of that, so they switched to Linux. Um, 2014 kicks things off even more aggressively while we had just six Linux satellites in 2013. Planet Labs launched 33 of them in 2014. So we've gone from six and, and one here and there to, to 33 Linux powered satellites in one year. Now, SpaceX also flew back their first successful landing with their Linux powered avionics, driving that all the way through to successful landing. Uh, we have another landing success there, once again, successfully touching down and being fully reusable, powered by Linux. And then we have Linux on the second ever solar sail mission. So the Planetary Society launched the LightSail 1 mission, which is a in Tyvek Intrepid board, and that was controlling all of their deployment and mission software and that was just running Linux there. Planet Labs also dropped out another 40 Dove satellites. Um, we keep moving forward. We've got yet more Doves, 32 more Doves from Planet Labs. We have eight more launches, five landings, and two space drones, if you think of it, autonomously flown all the way to the space station on Linux. We have a really big year in 2017 because Planet Labs dropped out a whole heap of satellites. Uh, something in the yeah, 140 and then and SpaceX dropped out 18 launches three more flights to the space station entirely autonomously flying themselves there powered by Linux and HP shipped a supercomputer past the one teraflop mark into space it was a um, it was based on one of their stock machines but it had to be modified and put into a specific chassis in order to make it fit into the equipment racks of the ISS. Um, but it also ran there for a whole year. So in 2018, the HP machine was considered operational after a year of testing, and it was made available for people who were doing science on the ISS to have their payloads run the software that they needed to process their data, running that in space on the space station so that they didn't have to download the data. So if they sent up an instrument that did a lot of data production and they wanted to process it, before it came down so that they didn't have to send back so much, there was now a computer on the space station that they could use to run regular operational software like they would in a lab back at home, powered by Linux. Uh, the Marco CubeSats in 2018 also carried Linux into deep space with the Captera Linux board running one of their cameras. You can't barely read the font there, but yes, uh, it was a module. Once again, this kind of payload controller scenario, but that board was running Linux, taking photos of Mars as it flew past with the InSight lander mission. Uh, Planet Labs launched a whole heap more. We've got SpaceX doing a whole bunch more landings. Uh, they also put out the first Starlink satellites this in 2018. And those Starlink satellites are really going to set a trend for Linux. So the other highlight being the Cherry Red Tesla Roadster, those videos coming back to Earth streamed from Starman orbiting were powered by Linux. So Linux had a fairly big year in space that year. Uh, 2019, we get 32 more doves. We get SpaceX actually landing more times than they launched because they had two Falcon Heavy launches, which meant that they actually landed more times than they launched. Uh, we get more autonomous flights to the space station and we have SpaceX actually just blowing away all of the stuff that even from back in 2017, when Planet Labs put, was putting out 140 of their doves, uh, SpaceX just almost eclipsed them in two single launches. They put out 60 of their first prototype set and then another 60 of their final production set for 120 towards the end of the year. And that's just the start. So at this point, we've got 120 plus several hundred more doves all running Linux. So several hundred Linux satellites in space at this point in 2019.
and it starts to increase fairly aggressively. So in 2020, we've got a few, just a few more doves. We've got crewed missions. So Linux is now being trusted with the lives of astronauts in 2020. So the Crew Dragon flies all the way to the space station powered by Linux and NASA has trusted it to run that software stack on top of Linux. There's a whole bunch as to how they get to that level of trust, but it's being powered by Linux and that's freaking awesome. So we get 893 Starlink satellites, which means that we go from having only a few to Starlink being one of the dominant sets of satellites in the entire low Earth orbit area to the point where, based on the stats I was able to estimate, at the 31.5% of all active satellites were now powered by Linux, almost entirely based on Starlink. 2021 was a pretty big year with even more satellites going up. We get another nearly 900 coming from St Starlink. We get the Ingenuity drone on Mars. That's entirely powered by Linux and more about that coming up. Planet Labs drop out another just short of 50 of their Dove satellites. We get a whole bunch more landings. We get more autonomous flights to the space station. And at the end of 2021, we had 40.5% of active satellites running Linux. So we've literally gone up by 9% in the span of one year off the back of SpaceX launching their Starlink satellites. So Linux is becoming extremely well established in space. Um, now, in 2022 so far, that's continued to grow already. We've had Flock 4X, another 44 Dove satellites going into space from Planet Labs. They're continuing to run their Linux stack in space, turning fantastic imagery from that. We have already had a bunch more Starlinks going up, and we still have 40.5% coming through. We haven't had any disaster that's chipped them away. So let's get to some pictures of what these satellites actually look like and what sort of things that are running this Linux stack in space. What do they actually look like? It's, you know, it's one thing everyone thinks a satellite is a certain kind of thing. Well, let, let's have a look at what they actually look like. So we've got QuakeSat. I mentioned earlier that it was just a diamond Prometheus PC-104. So it's just this little 10 centimeter board. It, it's tiny. You can see that, the you know, you can't really see it without having a CAD diagram just sort of cut it apart. But the inside of that is mostly being done to keep springs and batteries and folding to keep the weight down because there's a weight limit on these things. They're only allowed to weigh three kilos. So there's a kilo for every 10 centimeter cube of volume. And so they're quite mass constrained and don't have a lot of room for things inside. So they end up using these fairly small boards. Um, a large part of the inside was taken up by the room they needed for that telescoping boom you see at the top, which is part of their experiment to look for electromagnetic disturbances about earthquakes. We've got the Dove satellites. So Planet Labs put their Dove, it's actually now called Planet, uh, put their Dove satellites up there. They're a low powered x86 processor, nothing crazy. It's just running Ubuntu server, but in order to make it fit into their package, which is actually mostly just a telescope. You can't see it from the front there because it's, this is the rear view, but the a lot of the electronics are down in that end there because almost the whole body of that satellite is taken up with a huge camera lens. It's not even a camera lens, it's actually a catadioptric telescope. Uh, it's, if I remember off the top of my head, the focal length is about uh, a meter. So they've folded it up a meter long lens arrangement into a 30 centimeter or 30 point, uh, 35 centimeter long little box. And it didn't leave a lot of room around the edges. So they actually designed their own motherboards and electronics, wrapped them around that lens, and then put all of the sensors down at the end there in that little protrusion. It's, it's a very impressive feat of achievement that they've managed to engineer all of that into such a tight package. We've got the Dragon spacecraft, which people might be a bit more familiar with. Now, that there is a first generation Dragon 1 on one of the cargo resupply missions. It was flying in formation there in that video you saw, powered by Linux. Linux powered flight computers using sensors to determine the position of the space station, the real time position of the Dragon capsule in space, and making a whole bunch of flight corrections, firing thrusters and keeping itself in position there, waiting to be grabbed. The whole time, all being done with Linux. Now, from SpaceX haven't published this stuff publicly, but the 
questions they have answered in public, things like Reddit Ask Me Anything, and a few interviews people have done, have covered in depth some of the things that they do to make these more resilient. So they're running with a three sets of dual core x86 processors. Apparently the Dragon capsule is running a 3.2 kernel with the real-time patches, and they are actually using one instance of Linux on each processor core. So they've probably got some kind of hypervisor thing going on there that sort of divides the two cores into two systems, um, unless they're dual sockets. Again, not something they've really made public. So what we've got here though, is we've got dual pairs that are working in triplicate. So they're having each pair vote against each other. And then the group of three are looking for consensus on those votes. And it's quite a sophisticated system of redundancy and uh, checking against other systems in order to give them the reliability they need to have people on board and for you know NASA to trust that because it's, they carried forward that same flight architecture and that same software and computer stack into the second generation of the Dragon capsule. Um, they also are using Linux on Starlink, which has even less info about what's going on board because uh, other than the fact that it runs Linux, I actually can't find anything about the processors on board, but it is definitely running Linux, that much I can confirm. Uh, we've got the more famous example of late, which is, uh, I mean, everyone should be able to see it there. Uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. All right, how about I zoom in a bit? Uh, we have the Ingenuity Space Helicopter, which is a Snapdragon 801. Uh, it has a 3.4 kernel with the real-time preempt patches on it. It's a Linaro-based operating system, and it has a radiation-hardened FPGA for critical power management timer stuff so that it can keep its batteries alive in the cold Martian night. Um, the interesting thing that goes with it is it's actually not the only Linux computer on Mars. So there's actually a matching Snapdragon 801 in with Zigbee Radio, and it's in the belly of the Mars Perseverance rover. And that actually communicates with the helicopter by having the rover, which is the primary computer for the whole mission, that rover passes a set of data to the computer on the rover, the Snapdragon 801 on the rover, via a UART. Um, I think it's just an 1115 board, you know, regular old UART like you'd use to talk to, you know, a little embedded computer on your desk. And then that processes it, sends it over to the to the helicopter with the Zigbee radios on board them both, and then that's how they talk together. Now, there's also a third. So that third computer was actually the one that recorded all the pictures and video that we saw during the Perseverance landing. So if you remember the seven minutes of terror and a lot of the footage that came back during that was actually being sent back from a Linux computer running off USB cameras in a ruggedized compact PCI system. So let's get into what's difficult in space. I'm going to stick to the stuff in space because making things sturdy for launching into space is that's that's just regular engineering. You can make it more sturdy. You can seal it up, put packaging foams and, and other stuff to keep things in place. It's not as much of a it's not a challenge we're going to focus on here. Um, you know, so space radiation is probably the most obvious one that people tend to get because uh, the super dense RAM is already vulnerable to cosmic rays. We get bit flips and these sorts of things. That's why we have ECC. So uh, the electrical transients we get from radiation is a pretty well understood thing, uh, but it can even degrade silicon. So if you get a high energy cosmic ray that slams into the silicon chip, it can actually damage the chemical nature of that silicon and, and physically degrade that chip, which over time can lead to failures. Um, Air, there's no air in space, it is a vacuum, and air takes away heat from everything down here on Earth. So space doesn't let us get away with having too much heat. We have to be really careful about that. Uh, volatile substances also outgas in a vacuum. Uh, all the little oils and things that sort of make most of the world move around here on Earth, you have to be very careful about them in space because they will slowly evaporate in space and coat instruments and equipment that you don't want coated in these things. And so if you put a camera up there and you're not careful about what you assemble this with, you might end up with this oily film over your camera that ruins everything. Um, the vacuum being a very good insulator means that you can get these massive electrostatic charges of over 10,000 volts 
just building up on the surface of a satellite, which is why you have to be very careful about your grounding and your installation and the electrical connections. Um, and a silent killer from many, many years back that's still a persistent problem is tin whiskers, which are these really fascinating little sort of icicles that grow out of tin parts. And if you get them growing in the wrong places, they can create shorts. So you can get electrical shorts in your equipment just growing out of the physical equipment just over time. If you don't, you know, take the effort to not use tin solder uh, and, and to try and make sure that you don't have any tin leads in areas. Um, that comes back to, again, the electrical grounding because you get these kinds of discharges with those kind of electrostatics as well. And you have to use things like the outgassing because, um, yeah, so your thermal management is, is the key mainly. The rest of it is just careful engineering. Um, for what you have to do with those hardware failures, you end up using a lot of consensus algorithms, uh, hardware redundancy, and you can, if you're lucky, have radiation shielding. Um, power is another fun one because uh, on the Earth, power is easy to get. We, you know, usually you're not going to be too far from where you need to be, or if you're putting something somewhere, you can plan for it and easily stick a little windmill or a solar panel or something, it, and it doesn't matter because you can just put it on the ground or on a pole or whatever. Uh, in space, you're not so lucky uh, because every kilo you have to send up costs a lot of money, and so you want to use as little as you can, and solar panels aren't terribly light, at least good ones. So you've got to carefully balance the amount of mass you're willing to give to having a solar panel with the amount of mass you're willing to get you know power from so very careful trade there and the same thing goes for batteries because batteries are fairly heavy as well um, you do have to be careful about which kinds of batteries some won't work in space you can't just have a regular old lead acid car battery the water would evaporate and it would be dead so you tend to see most things using things like lithium ion batteries now. Yeah, they were more fancy, complicated ones back in the day, but that's mostly started to phase out now. And, and lithium ion batteries, uh, just like the uh, 18650s you see in sort of like the, the vape pens, the drones, the remote control cars, and all the other things that they go into these days. Um, communication is the other big one. Now on Earth, it's pretty easy to set 24 seven communication in most places you'd want to put a computer, uh, even if it's just via a radio link, it's not too hard. And on earth, radio links are quite easy to get because you can you can use Wi-Fi or you can use LoRa or any of these other unlicensed bands that let you do whatever you like with them. Uh, in space, everything needs a license. You can't actually have any kind of a radio in space without getting appropriate permits. It's, it's pretty paperwork heavy. Um, so you tend to see fairly narrow band, very specific radios that you only use when you're over a ground station that you control, it tends to make all that paperwork a lot more easy. So you end up with the situation where your communication window might be quite short. So maybe just one hour as it's quickly or less than an hour, even as it, as it zips overhead. And then it might not be overhead again for a whole week. So you might only be able to talk to your satellite once a week for 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, you've got to tell it everything it needs to do for the next week. So you tend to send your instructions in batches, use data compression as much as possible. Um, some people are now experimenting, experimenting with satellite to satellite communications. So the kind of companies like um, Inmarsat and uh, uh, Iridium are now providing through various companies in the aerospace industry, uh, modules you can use on a satellite that will give you a TCP IP connection, just like your home internet, but to the satellite because they've put a tiny radio on the satellite that talks to the satellites further up. And then just like it, if you're in an airplane with a satellite phone, it can talk up to this satellites above it and you get a consistent regular old you know, network connection to the satellite. But these things are all trade-offs in terms of cost and power and not a lot of people get those. So same thing goes for the other thing that people are experimenting with now to get more data, even if it doesn't get them more time, which is optical communication. So you're starting to see more experimenting around laser communications. So using uh, high speed laser links, just like if you it effectively, it even uses the same frequency of light, actually, uh, the same kind of lasers, just more powerful as you would see in a fiber optic connection between two networks, which is in Iraq. So, you know, uh, 15, uh, 1500 nanometer sort of territory laser light just through the air, not through a optical fiber. So 
that, that's the sort of challenges and, and responses we have to some of the problems in that. And, and you know, that, that's just the very high level stuff. Um, but similarly high level, we have the kind of ways you approach, you know, uh, keeping the reliability. So you tend to, with all those challenges, want to break down and isolate your failure domains. So you, you get control domains where you put as little uh, responsibility on a piece as possible. So if you have an instrument, uh, it will only be responsible for its own tasks. You'll have effectively a button, a software button, so to speak, that says uh, take the picture and a software button that says give me the data. And, and you won't expect it to be managed by the same computer. You'll have small computers spread around in order to delegate the tasks and, and separate that risk out. Uh, the same thing goes for super, uh, supervisory hierarchies. What you get is you get a chain of these things. So you get top-down control. You get a, a most important thing and then less important things, and, and you can make those less important things less robust to save money. Uh, you get watchdogs, good old-fashioned watchdog timers to let you know if something's dead and give it a kick to try and make it come back. And you get good old-fashioned redundancy. Uh, I don't really think I need to go too deeply into redundancy. Uh, most people who get into computing and you know listen to Linux conferences and stuff have probably come across the idea of a redundant system before. You know, either through a load balancer or redundant power supply or some other redundant hardware. It's a pretty common concept, kind of self-explanatory. You see it a lot in spacecraft. You get redundant hardware, you just do. Control domains are there for isolating failures, like I said. So you, you minimize the complexity of each subsystem and you increase the robustness only ne where necessary. So if you're willing to sacrifice a science instrument there, you can make that one holding the beaker, you know, die at the drop of a hat because it's the least important thing. And you can trade the kind of protections, whether they be cost or power or mass, because you're always trying to trade those. So you, you can trade those to put the robustness where it is most critical. So you can have your power and communications and data be more robust than the instruments on board so that you've always got those working. And then, you know, you can have your, your management one be the most robust system. You might have that SpaceX style triplicate redundancy on your on your mission management computer, or it might be the only radi radiation hardened piece of equipment on the whole satellite, just, just to guarantee that level of reliability you need to get that working. Uh, we've got watchdog timers. Uh, they are very widely used. Software and hardware versions of them exist. Uh, if you haven't come across a watchdog timer, it is essentially something going, are you awake? Are you awake? Are you awake? You have a reset loop and it resets every time you get that positive response saying it's awake. If it isn't awake and you expire the timer, you kick it. They get fancier. You've got ones that have self resets, uh, you know, precision timing ones that, you know, send the message before the timeout and uh, much more fancy versions for specific use cases. But in general principle, you see them used in a whole variety of ways in this in domain because it's one of the staple systems for increasing the reliability of a system. You, you keep an eye on it, and if it dies, you reset it. And if it doesn't come back, then you start investigating your failure. You get the supervisory hierarchies, which is part of that whole, if it dies, kick it, make it come back. So you might have a watchdog in software. So your operating system running the flight control software might be looking at the flight control software and going, hmm, I didn't get my answer back fast enough. Reboot. But that's a very high level version. What you see when you actually break it down and start to look at these kinds of watchdogs is it starts to look more like this. So you'll see a sort of division between systems there. You'll have that lower half, which is your you know payload control. And then you've got your flight control on the top half. So you've got software watchdogs coming from your flight control software, watching all the parts of your payload control software so that your flight control knows everything that's going on in all of the subsidiary systems. And you've got varying hierarchies of these things so that you've got most critical stuff at the top. Like I said, back on that Ingenuity helicopter one, they had an FPGA that was radiation hardened for power management. That's the kind of thing that you might put at the top of this kind of a supervisory hierarchy because it's the piece that you know is most reliable. You, you have it at this sort of a chain of trust in these control systems and management processes to kick things back to life in order to avoid losing your mission. And, and even that is an abstracted version because when you actually get into the sort of examples that people put up in textbook versions of this, it starts to look way more complicated. It's a lot more like that in the real world, but we don't have time to sit here and talk through a process flow like that. That's no, that's no one's idea of fun. Um, so let's talk more about 
making an actual space with a Linux. So if you have your Linux kernel, what do you have to do with it in order to actually make it safe for space? Well, you're obviously going to need to have the drivers and software for the hardware you want. That's your first problem. But Linux has a lot of those built in. But a lot of space hardware is pretty custom, so it might not have them. You might need to build those and test them in both software and hardware, because sometimes you're driving hardware like case in point recently, the unlatching on something like the mirror in the James Webb Space Telescope, they had software driving that and that software had to be tested that it matched the hardware, that when the software tells the hardware to do something, it's not telling it to do the wrong thing. So you test the hardware and the software. Um, and then you have to, you know, have the mission management software on top of your kernel to actually do that. So you get this interface there of software talking to a kernel, asking hardware to do things and the software on top of it. And then it ends up being a very large amount of integration testing. So, so that is actually the primary thing. And, you know, the, the 80% that gets done is, is validating, testing, revalidating, retesting, changing, revalidating, retesting, because it's all about reliability. And, and you have to try and make that reliability threshold get reached. Uh, real-time operating systems are one of the ways you get that. Uh, it's a way you can have a hard real-time versus a soft real-time versus a I don't care. It's the question of, is it okay to be late? If you have to send a signal to a motor or a valve or a, a sensor or something, um, and it has to happen exactly on time or it might break, you might need a hard real-time system. If it only has to be fast enough, you might only need a soft real-time system. Uh, if you need to have something that responds instantly to a sensor, the moment that sensor is tripped, you again might need to have a hard real-time system because you might need something that can always handle that in the moment it happens, nothing blocking it and immediately handling that interrupt. Um, and again, this comes down to preemption and interrupt handling and the final part being scheduling algorithms. Uh, scheduling algorithms in real-time operating systems tend to be more fair. They tend to guarantee you get a certain amount of time and your software then has enough time to do its job. Um, you kind of trade guaranteed time for throughput. So each individual process doesn't have as much power, but they all definitely get time, um, which is part of the basis for RT preempt. You get the scheduler modifications, uh, it started out back from Ingo Mola in uh, two, uh, 2005, started off with a 2611 kernel. Uh, it added two more preemption levels, which are how deeply you can say, no, immediately respond to this. Uh, and those have in large part actually wound up in mainline, but there still is a, a chunk of code that has yet to become mainline kernel. Um, and even with all of that work over a, you know, over a decade's worth of work, there are still small sections that are not fully preemptible, even with your fully preemptible mode turned on. Uh, they are the most critical parts of the kernel that there just hasn't been a good way to make preemptible. So, so even with the real-time patches, there are going to be places where Linux might not work and you might need to look at a different real-time operating system, say like free, free RTOS or something, if, if you need that truly hard real-time. Um, and that free, uh, free, uh, free RTOS is a real-time operating system uh, sponsored by Amazon. And it is another open source example that could be used in instead of uh, real-time Linux in that scenario. Um, embedded Linux is what you'll normally find used in these environments. You get uh, things like Yocto and Open Embedded. Uh, you get Buildroot. Uh, I didn't include Linaro in here because it's sort of out of fashion in the embedded space. It's kind of more of a phone thing. Um, you get OpenWRT uh, less commonly because it's not as flexible. Uh, it works where the hard work gets done to make it work, but it's not as inherently flexible. Um, you also see sort of more high level build tools, like uh, a number of tools are built on top of Debian, such as ISAR and ELBE, which combine some of the lower level things like Buildroot into automation tooling to take and combine your own embedded Debian version. And there are similar tools for the Gentoo ecosystem. So uh, Gentoo being a very flexible Linux distro has a number of tools to build down into tiny embedded images. Um, and then there's obviously the do it all from scratch, um, which has been part of the process in a lot of these other cases, like the uh, UC Linux ones would likely have been quite custom from scratch ones. Um, this is the sort of thing you see gradually becoming more and more common is the reusability and repeatability, which is where you started to get the software ecosystem come together. So 
there's things like QBOS, which is a build root based custom Linux distribution, uh, and NASA's CFS and OpenSAT kit, which builds CFS on top of Linux. So uh, you get the core flight system, which is an operating system agnostic uh, flight software set. It does a bunch of hardware abstractions and uh, it runs on a number of operating systems. It's built around a message bus so that you can have multiple people all talking together without any piece getting blocked. Again, getting back to that real time thing, they have to do their job immediately. Uh, and it has a number of things that are already built for common spacecraft tasks, but it's not really well designed around beginners. The, a lot of the documentation is very technical down in things like registers, mode sets and, and very low level documentation. It can be a bit intimidating to get, get your head around. Uh, and it is more designed around real-time systems. Linux is, it's not treated literally as a second class citizen, but it is definitely a less supported platform. They view it as sort of a development target for getting your development environment up and running and, and getting started with that kind of a thing. Um, the, uh, the other one I mentioned was QBOS, which was originally developed by the QBOS Corporation. They are no longer maintained it. And the, uh, the issue for them was that they were seeing more customers come for their um, for their mission operations management software stack, not the software on the satellites. So they naturally shifted their business. But it is open source and it is actually maintained by a community. Uh, as as you saw there, there, there is actually a still group of people keeping that one open. Um, and it's, as I said earlier, a Linux based system using build root. A large portion of the stack is built in Rust. Uh, they have Rust and Python SDKs and it uses GraphQL APIs between the talking of the components. So it's, it's quite a more modern environment than the very low level, uh, you know, hard, like the very different contrast in it is a very more modern, uh, GraphQL. It's <laughs> hard to get more modern than that when you compare that to sort of a, a, you know, raw memory message bus. <laughs> um, and as for how I actually wound up traveling down here is because um, I decided I wanted to build a satellite. Uh, I was looking in the mirror one day at the start of the pandemic in 2019 and well, 2020, I guess, and, and sort of was like, I really should do something. And uh, yeah, I decided to build a satellite. You can see there that's the uh, my, my benchtop prototyping. It doesn't have all the pieces it needs. It has the computer hardware it needs. The rest of it is just space to make sure I've got room for things. Uh, like batteries, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you can't really see it in there, but that's a, a battery from Linux uh, Linux.conf that AU from 2015. Um, and there's a Raspberry Pi wedged in there, and there's a, a fairly large camera lens of my own in there. Um, but yeah, that's what dragged me into getting stuck into all of this. Um, I still want to get that finished, <laughs> so naturally, I'm still involved in all of this, um, which leads to the bigger picture. So. As you saw earlier, the number of satellites being launched with Linux is rapidly growing, but a lot of it is, uh, if, if the information that's being published is to be believed, fairly antiquated with the exception of ones that are frozen and kept up to date. So you, you see a situation where you know, we've got a need for a bigger organization. The situation is quite a bit similar to where the automotive industry was a decade ago. We had the start of the automotive grade Linux project in 2012, and it might be time for us to see an equivalent in the space and aerospace area. We have a number of things around the drone and the, the aero in aerospace, but we don't really have a equivalent for space. Um, you know, and, and there's a number of things that might be relevant for us to do. Um, yeah, so uh, questions? Hello, it's me again. I'm here to ask questions. That was a great fun talk. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions. If people want to vote them in the questions tab so that we can prioritize the popular ones and take the rest to the text chat afterwards. Uh, we've got about six minutes for this. Um, that was so good. Uh, the first question that we've got is are security concerns a common consideration for space, space platforms, especially since the systems are related to human well-being? Oh, ab absolutely. In in the uh, diagram there, there, there was a, it might be a little bit hard to see, but there's actually a whole block there dedicated to security. Uh, things like encryption are called out and, and it's one of the primary systems in, you know, in the actual control flow. Um, you know, the from the telecommand block on the left side there, straight down into the authentication and the decryption and the security before being passed on to anything else and encrypting the downlink as well. So, so encryption is definitely something that is actually considered an important part of these systems, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. 
uh, our next highest voted one is how do these systems get tested on Earth? Uh, that is a fun and interesting topic. Uh, I skipped over my little one uh, because I have been getting to grips with that. Now, on a lot of the commercial projects, it gets built custom for your project. You'll build your test harnesses, you'll build your own uh, testing equipment, you'll wire up a system to a test harness and you'll have it hooked up to signal monitoring equipment like a signal analyzer and things like that and you'll guarantee that your software is sending out your signals with the exact right timing and you'll run it into a simulator that determines whether it's doing things like that so uh, you'll effectively like using something like the Dragon capsule as an example they would have the computers hooked up to a flight simulator and the software running on the computers would fly the simulator instead of a person to test that the simulator flies the way the computers are supposed to fly it and, and you sort of build these scenarios up in order to do testing. Um, that's the large end. On the smaller end with things like these open source projects and, and where we really need to start seeing more things is, is similar to the regular embedded space. You, you need things like reconfigurable micro SD cards in order to flash an OS image onto a piece of hardware, run it through a test cycle, and then critically test that it upgrades correctly because what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to send up a whole bunch of data and then have it do the update while you're not looking. And if it fails, it has to fall back. Uh, there's been a number of instances over the last few years of the Mars rovers needing to fall back more uh, ingenu yeah, more ingenuity than perseverance. Um, no, sorry, curiosity instead of perseverance. And, and it has had to fall back to its alternative computer a number of times. Um, but this is routine. They build them with two computers, an A and a B, and they do this naturally in order to have the level of robustness in that fault tolerance stuff we mentioned earlier. But to do that on cheaper hardware, where you don't have a billion dollar budget, you, you do that in software. You have things like how on an Android phone, if your update is broken, you fall back to the old version. And, and we need to be in a position to test that sort of thing on regular old Linux. And, and you test that with things like a reconfigurable micro SD card. That makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. Uh, uh, next question is, given how much of Linux has been historically based around community and that Linux in space is entirely duopolized by the two largest satellite operators, how do we encourage sharing their learnings to enable more s small operators to leverage this for small small emissions? I'll put that in the text chat. <laughs> uh, uh, this slide right here. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that question was asked it was earlier asked on earlier before on, I... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that is actually something I'm, I'm quite concerned about. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the, the people at SpaceX are doing an absolutely s tremendous job. Um, they are running a custom kernel, so I'm sure they're putting on all the security fixes they find, but it's 3.2. So, uh, you know, that's, that's getting kind of long in the tooth. Um, maybe in a situation where it's being talked to by other equipment, that might not be good. I mean, they're not obviously having any random computer connected to the you know, to the rocket or the space capsule. They're in control of all that, so they're not really at risk there. But it's still the sort of thing that if your satellite is talking, you know, as part of a network, you, you need to know about. And so we do need a bigger community. We need to to start looking seriously at, at starting a broader community around this. That's really useful. Um, I lost track. The problem with doing this out of order is that now it's out of order. <laughs> uh, I'll go from the bottom. What's the market share of Linux in space these days compared to traditional embedded OS? Says this is an uh, early uh, well, question as well, so you probably answered this yep. as well. Yep, yeah. definitely covered it on the. It was uh, back to here. Forty point five. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very early question. Uh, what sort of code and coding methods? are used for these platforms. Also, is the Linux networking used locally or for the up-down link? Uh, interesting example, considering I stopped right on the correct slide here. The Linux networking <laughs> is used internally for CubeOS. Uh, so it's actually using HTTP with regular on, on the loopback. So these services are all popped into ports on the loopback IP address, and they all talk to each other on the loopback. So, so it's actually using the, the Linux native stack internally. But for communication up and down, uh, barring the instances where there's someone who's using, uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, there's these companies that are developing sort of uh, satellite to satellite communication so that you get the equivalent of a satellite internet connection, but for your satellite. Uh, other than that, no, because 
the space to ground and ground to space is normally done over radio protocols, sort of more more akin to like frame relay, where you'll just build a big buffer of data, broadcast it up with the radio on the other end, giving you minimal acknowledgement. And then you get an acknowledgement at the end of your broadcast, and then it comes back. Uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated with optical stuff. It tends to be a lot more of a continuous acknowledgement of the data transmission, but it's still not a proper TCP IP sort of native networking stack. But there are definitely a number of projects that use that internally because it's quite a valuable way to break up a system. So if you want that robustness in terms of having things split into multiple segments, you will often have those two segments talk over a network stack. So you might have something like a, 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 um, like a network switch done in a you know, rad hardened FPGA and uh, um. you might split the two computers in half. I will cut us off there. Uh, we are out of time. And I have missed an important question, which I'll put into the text chat. There are a few other questions as well. Cats sniffing I'll the I'll definitely microphone. be sticking Thank around so to uh, answer the questions. Uh, head into the post-talk chat for Kiora Theatre in there. Um, next up, we've got Ryan Werner with virtual events behind the scenes of an engaging community conference. And uh, for people as well, if you're a professional or a contributor uh, ticket holder, remember to join us from 6.30 AEDT in Venulus for the Professionals Delegates uh, Networking Session and a really interesting presentation from Anthony Green on election analysis. Thank you so much, Sam. This has been really great. I hope you have a great rest of your day.